Hey, what's going on guys? It's Brown with Men's Comics. Real quick before we get into this video, I want to let you guys know about a new exclusive variant that's available up at the 616comics.com right now. That's right, if you're a fan of DC Comics, if you're a fan of Batman, if you're a fan of Catwoman, they have Batman Catwoman number one exclusive variant. Not too many times you see a Jim Lee exclusive, but they got one right now. It's available for pre-order. They got three variants set. They got a trade dress, a virgin, and a sketch available. Make sure you guys go to the616comics.com. Get your pre-orders in right now. Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Brian Jack with Superman's Comics, and we are here to give you those market trends in the comic community. That's right. This is that three up, three down. We're going to give you three up trends and three down trends, like I just said, going on in the comic community. This week, everyone's getting ready for that trick-or-treating coming up. Some people are, some people aren't. I think we're doing mostly a Halloween party at the house, maybe a couple houses here. But either way, Halloween and then Thanksgiving coming up. Thanksgiving's always my favorite part, but enough about that. Let's just get into these, starting with that three up. And the first one we're talking about is that DC future state. Yeah, a lot of buzz about future state. Now, I'll say, this is on the up because everybody's talking about it, which which is, means it's just already a successful program for DC. Uh, there's some negatives. Some people don't love the way it's being released. Some people have been anti this whole like 5G initiative, uh, future of the DC universe um, concept, which Brian, you and I both have been very supportive of because we, we've been on record saying that like, you know, comic book characters, one thing that they're kind of missing is they don't really age up. We don't really yeah. kind of- That's Same reason why we like Spider-Man life story. Exactly, because you, you get to see that future, that next step. Um, and I think Future State is going to provide a little bit of that to us. So it, it, it's exciting. Um, the, the way that some of the stories are kind of like backup stories in another book, um, it's going to have to wait to see how that plays out. It, it, it's been brought up before that this is actually like a really common way of releasing uh, comics in other countries. And that, you know, this is kind of a new style that's being kind of test it out so it'll be interesting to see if, if people kind of give that same value to a book that's say not associated with the cover um but there's a lot of back issues right now spiking um we've already seen like the stuff surrounding the future state wonder woman stuff surrounding future state uh aquaman stuff surrounding um future state speculation involving batman and uh who is going to be the various characters uh, and who is the flash. So all of that is good for the market and good for DC comics. Yeah. I'm excited to see how it goes. I'm excited to pick it up and read it. Even if there's people out there probably not going to like it, especially from a spec standpoint, you never know what the spec standpoint though, but either way, as a comic book reader and a comic book collector, I'm excited to see where these stories go. And like you said, we've been talking about it for a while, especially with the 5g. Yeah. So I'm all in on future state and Florida state. <laughs> but the next one we're talking about on the three up is that milestone comics this has gotten it's gotten a little buzz before but now it's got even more of a little buzz with the whole michael b jordan thing right yeah and that's what i really like about this um we talked about milestone when initially the announcement was made that it was coming back to publishing and going to come back as an entity and they were going to look to do movie and tv and all of that um and we talked about how like this universe of characters um, kind of with this like for us, by us approach, um, people of color telling stories that really um, were challenging at the time. And they, I, some of the issues they tackled in the 90s in Milestone Comics from, you know, safe sex to uh, um, political party choice within like, uh, com like racial communities and uh, all of those type of topics were just, yeah, just a I want to say ahead of time, but they're just heady for comics. It's awesome. It was great to see. Um, and there's so much potential within the Milestone universe. So we started seeing people picking up these number one issues, buying these comics. Um, and then, you know, like you see in the spec cycle, stuff starts to kind of dwindle down. And then there was more talk about a, a Static Shock movie coming. So once we learned that, like, Warner Brothers was moving forward with that, more excitement into the milestone universe but as you mentioned brian the inclusion of michael b jordan as really kind of the kevin feige of this milestone universe of of being the one who's gonna produce this static shock movie and with the hopes of being able to spin it into a franchise for warner brothers there was a lot of talk about uh and we certainly talked about on this channel about you know a, a black superman played by 
Michael B. Jordan, his his kind of like love and uh, desire to be involved in the DC universe. This seems like a, just an amazing way for him to be involved and somebody who's already proven with Killmonger that he can deliver a major role in, in one that can connect with comic book fans. Uh, now being kind of in a position of power and control, he's also the one who adapted Raising Dion for Netflix. He produced that project. So I think this is nothing but positive things. I'm very, very bullish, not only on Static Shock, which seems obvious, but the other characters within the Milestone universe, especially ones that Michael B. Jordan may play in the future, like Icon or Hardwire. Yeah, speaking of Michael B. Jordan, I've been re-watching this TV show, Friday Night Lights, with Michael B. Jordan. A little bit older than when he was in The Wire, but and I love Friday Night Lights. Reminds me of high school football. Although, playing high school football in a D.C. suburb, I think it's probably a little bit different than down there in Texas. But either yeah. way, football is football. But the last one we're going to talk about, on the three up portion this week is we're talking Power Rangers. Power Rangers got a lot of buzz going right now. We're talking about Draken, talking about a new Green Ranger that was just introduced in Power Rangers 55. Not revealed yet, but introduced, right? Absolutely, yeah. A um, lot of buzz on Power Rangers. And, and everything that's going on on the publishing side has been amazing. Two new series. I think Power Rangers is going to put up a record sales number once Boom reports sales numbers for issue number one um, of both Mighty Morphin and Power Rangers. I think some of those high ratio variants, some of that Peach Moko art certainly helped. We've seen store exclusives get announced from stores that never mess with Power Ranger variants. So this is exciting time for Power Ranger fans, but this was all kind of like just talk about things that like people within a community are excited about. Now we're starting to see that outside community. We've talked about this before. You know, when you have fandoms like G.I. Joe or Ninja Turtles or Power Rangers, there's always communities built in that support those. And then it's when the outside public starts to get in and buy up those books. That's when we start to see prices go crazy. And we're going to start seeing that with Power Rangers as there was major announcement, new showrunner put in charge um, of a new Power Rangers film universe uh, Hasbro is going to go forward both film and TV interconnected, which is an exciting thing. It sounds like they're still going to go with like the current Nickelodeon type stuff that's going on, but there is going to be a new Power Ranger universe. It sounds like it's going to be more geared towards what we've been hoping for, more adult, um, but still keeping like everything that we love about Power Rangers and classic about Power Rangers. So this is all exciting. And there's been a lot of sales of the Hamilton 1994 first appearance. Um, we've seen a lot of sales of key books like Lord Draken's first appearance as well as Ranger Slayer's first appearance. And there's a lot, a lot of excitement surrounding the brand new issue 55 with that new Green Ranger. Yeah, and you bring up a good point when you're talking about the G.I. Joe Transformers stuff that we grew up with. Of course, if you watch this channel, you know I'm a huge Master of the Universe fan, Jack's a G.I. Joe fan. And I think as each year goes by, we always talk about we buy up our nostalgia. So with each, each of those passing years, people from that age group, from Power Rangers, are getting into that age of where we are with, when I talked about those 80s franchises, where they're starting to have that disposable income and they're nostalgia driven. So they're buying up the older Power Rangers issues as well as the new ones. And it's not like some young kid can afford these high ratio variants or much less a regular comic book at these days. So I think that's some of the popularity. It's great story and nostalgia combined with those great cover art. But there's the three up for this week. We're going to tran <laughs> translate. <laughs> we're going to switch gears and we're going to discuss the three down trends in the comic community, which doesn't mean there's not buying opportunity there. But the first one we're talking about is DC distribution. We've talked about DC distribution before. We talked about how we didn't agree with Luna, UCS, we didn't like how Final Order Cutoff was earlier, but now we got DC distribution out of one of those, right? Yeah, and there's, it was no secret. Brian and I were not supportive of, of the change. Um, we were open to the multi-distributor system. I think multi-distributor systems work best in the marketplace, but it's got to be something that the whole marketplace gets on board with, not just one publisher kind of doing their own thing. And I know that they had kind of hoped other people would go along with them. But yeah, they went on that, Jerry Maguire. Right. Yeah, it didn't work that way. Um, and in their haste to do that, I think they made some decisions about partners that really raised some red flags about conflict of interest. Now we're already seeing one of those partners with UCS going by the wayside as now they are going solely through Lunar Distribution. So that means Midtown Comics involvement with DC Comics Distribution is no more. And now they will be solely through DCBS. Now, this 
is kind of big news also uh, from a retailer perspective. And this is really where this comes down to is I think the average consumer, the average fan, you're probably listening to this going, like, I don't really care where the comics come from. Um, and I get that. That's certainly understandable. But from a retailer uh, perspective, they saw their minimum orders get raised. Uh, they saw a lot of thresholds change. And the thing about that is that doesn't affect like big comic book shops. But if we truly want like this industry to grow, the, the accounts that a lot of people take for granted are like the sports card shops that stock a little bit of comics, uh, the candy shops that stock a little bit of comics. Um, you know, the independent grocery stores that stock a little bit of comics. When you start raising uh, their minimum order quantity by 20% because you need to fill a quota for a, um, for a company because of a, a cut they made, that, that starts to get difficult. So there's a lot of retailers that have been up in arms and frustrated about that. So and the distribution of DC Comics still continues to be something that is talked about and discussed and debated. But yeah, like we said, we're definitely with having additional distribution choices yes. because the next one we're talking about is there's diamond damages. Yes. You hear all the time about people either getting damages from diamond or their orders cut short. And we hear all the time from retailers, friends that are retailers, especially if you have a smaller diamond account and you kind of just left, you know, eating shit out of your hand, I guess you could say. Uh, it's, well, it's amazing. Um, you know, you can follow your favorite retailers, um, especially ones who are involved uh, in social media and do in, in the YouTube comic community. Um, it's really astounding. You see things like incentive variants, one in 100 incentive variants, just loosely thrown into boxes. Um, there was a retailer who posted recently on Instagram uh, that all of the incentive variants for that week's releases got put in a small box with no padding, nothing, just bounced around. Every incentive was destroyed. Um, and again, you got to remember a lot of their orders are based on these incentive variants. And what people don't understand is these incentive variants aren't always just simply replaced. Sometimes they do not have replacements. Sometimes well, they wouldn't order that many of the regular copy to begin with. Right. And a lot of times we have situations where orders are shorted. And when an order comes in short and a retailer reaches out to a publisher, they're told they don't have access to that, that book. And suddenly you're just shorted and out money. These, these are things that we're seeing consistently. Um, still, I hear about stores who talk regularly about diamond damages hitting the 10 to 15%. Um, I think we focused for a long time, especially at the Diamond Retailer Summit, you hear a lot of talk about the box quality. I think the box quality is important, but I think the true issue is just the handling of the books. These books are not treated like collectibles. Um, and we have to decide as an industry, is this a collectibles industry or is this still like a newsstand style business? And I know that with the way that our community is going to hear that and they're going to go, well, of course, this is a collectibles business. And I agree with you. And so this is the way that these books need to be treated. I will say uh, for all the negative that we've talked about, about Diamond uh, or about uh, DC's distribution, uh, some of the DC distributors started doing things like putting the incentives in bags and boards and in, in kind of like separate mailers and things like that. Those are things that are appreciated. Like I, damages even on regular covers are frustrating, but you expect no matter how good a system is, a certain small percentage. Um, when that percentage starts to creep over 10%, uh, you're having too many problems. And the problem is because of the Diamond One distributor system, which is why DC ultimately chose to go with it the way they went, a monopoly has power. There's no reason for them to change because what's your alternative? You're, if you're a comic shop, you need your comics and you can only buy them from one place. So. There definitely needs to be change in the distribution system. Um, I just, we haven't seen that answer yet. Uh, and unfortunately in both directions, the community's kind of down on distribution right now. Yeah, and it's one thing for damages. Is, I mean, it, yes, you want to protect it, but it's, it's a little bit more. I mean, if you run a business, you're going to have some damages. But when you don't get what you ordered, that's more my gripe. I mean, if you put yeah. the order in, if you put it in for final order cutoff, if you put it in for your initial order and then it ships and you've sold you know, pre-sale listings and people are going to say, oh, you can't do pre-sale. I mean, a lot of retailers thrive on pre-sale. You want to make sure that the inventory you have, you're not stuck with a bunch of overhead. And when your order comes and then you, you don't get what you order and then now you have to refund and let people know. And then heaven forbid, if it's a book that's taken off on the secondary market, because all those conspiracy theorists out there are like, oh, they just refunded my order because they're going to sell it somewhere else now. A lot of it's diamond shortages or allocations. Yeah, we're aware of one specific shortage on a popular book where you're going to start seeing re retailers 
um, be said that they were, you know, holding out or uh, not shipping a popular book when in reality they are, there are just massive, massive diamond shortages going on right now. Um, and it's not even always necessarily diamond, it could be the publisher, but there are massive shortages going on with, with several key books. But the last one I want to talk about on Three Down. I've heard a lot of people like this show, but it's, I don't see it doing much for the comic book right now. And we're talking about Hellstrom. Yeah, so I watched the entire eight episode season and this show is really good. Um, some people may feel else otherwise. I know that like the, the, the ratings online aren't awesome. Um, but to me, it's like a good horror show. The problem with it is, if I didn't tell you it was a Marvel show, you'd have no idea. There's no tie-in to the Marvel Universe almost at all. Uh, it, there is, not only that, like when the title screen starts, every Marvel show, you have that like Marvel logo and the, you know, the flipping of the comic pages or the new MCU version. None of that is here. And there's just a very, very small print on the bottom of the last screen of the, of the intro that says Marvel television. But I mean, I've never seen a more inconspicuous use of branding. And if Marvel, that's got to be intentional because if Marvel would usually want their branding all over it. Uh, it's, and it's already been announced that they're not going to move forward into a second season before this thing even came out. So this was part of the old Jeff Loeb uh, Marvel TV plan. And with Feige in control now and with the Marvel TV go falling up underneath the, uh, the, the MCU and the Disney Plus banner. The, apparently, we're still going to see Hulu um, shows, but these are all going to come brand new from Feige. So, yeah, Hellstrom's really DOA. There's really no reason to get excited about it. It's an enjoyable show, but it's a one you know going into that it's going to leave you hanging because you're not going to get any more of the show going forward. And on top of it, you know, it's not, if you're a comic fan and you're really hoping for like, you know, a whole bunch of Ghost Rider teases or things like that, you're not going to get that, um, even though that was the original initial plan, because this was all supposed to lead to Spirits of Vengeance and, uh, you know, Ghost Rider and Blade and all of that. And, you know, we're going to have to see that in some other form at some other time. Yeah, I mean, we did get news for some other Marvel TV, but might be saving that for next week's three up. So we'll wait on that. But either way, there's a three up, three down. Let us know what you guys think up in the community what do you think's down in the community we always like to hear your comments and with that being said guys this is brian jack with some men's comics we'll see you guys in the next video